from MCIE. Okay, I'm going to address this right from the start. The mention of Temple Grandin in some circles in the disability community can induce reactions from cringe to accolades. So let me tell you the reason why I wanted to have Temple on the podcast. In her new book, Visual Thinking, Dr. Grandin recognizes that our public schools are missing the mark with offering a flexible curriculum for all learners. And that for visual thinkers like her, hands-on classes are unfortunately absent from many school systems. I think that is a worthy message to amplify. My name is Tim Viegas from the Maryland Coalition for Inclusive Education, and you are listening to Think Inclusive, a show where with every conversation, we try to build bridges between families, educators, and disability rights advocates to create a shared understanding of inclusive education and what inclusion looks like in the real world. You can learn more about who we are and what we do at mcie.org. For this episode, I speak with Dr. Temple Grandin, professor of animal science at Colorado State University and the author of New York Times bestsellers, Animals in Translation, Animals Make Us Human, The Autistic Brain, and Thinking in Pictures, which became an HBO movie starring Claire Danes. Temple and I discuss why she wanted to write visual thinking, what educational advocates can learn from how she helped improve the welfare of farm animals, and what educators can do to support visual thinkers. Thank you so much for listening. And now, my interview with Dr. Temple Grandin. Dr. Temple Grandin, welcome to the Think Inclusive podcast. It's uh, great to be here. <laughs> so is it okay if I call you Temple or is Dr. That's Grandin? Fine. You can call me Temple. That's absolutely fine. So we're going to be talking about my new book on visual thinking. Yeah, fantastic. You've written a number of books. So The Autistic Brain, Thinking in Pictures, uh, which I read, I don't know how many years ago, um, and Animals in Translation. Why did you want to write visual thinking? What triggered that was uh, some trips I did right before COVID shut everything down. I went to two state-of-the-art pork processing plants. I went to a poultry processing plant, brand new one, in the Steve Jobs Theater. And I discovered there's a lot of things that we're not making. See, I mainly worked in the beef industry. And that equipment we actually still know how to make, but it's getting close to retirement. But the pork plant and the um, chicken plant, the equipment's all coming in from Holland. And there's a link here with our educational system. Hmm. We are now paying the price for taking out the shop classes. We are now paying the price in the food industry for shutting down in-house engineering 25 years ago. We're paying for it now. I've been in this industry for 50 years. And then when I went to the Steve Jobs Theater, I found out that the structural glass walls were designed in Italy, fabricated in Germany, and the carbon fiber roof came from Dubai. And I stood in the middle of that theater screaming, we don't make it anymore. And that was one of the things that triggered uh, doing this book. And then, of course, the lockdown came. So mm -hmm. I called up Betsy Lerner, my co-author, and um, I said, let's do the book. And we both had nothing else to do, so we did the book. <laughs> but the events that kind of motivated the theme of the book is a skill loss issue. Check out the people fixing escalators, the people fixing elevators these days. Your mechanic that comes on the plane to fix your plane. They're getting grayer and grayer and older and older. And uh, they're not getting replaced. And it no. goes back to the educational <clears throat> system. And and then mm -hmm. I just, when I did the autistic brain, I discovered that there was an object visualizer and a pattern thinker. And the kind of thinker like I am is the one that can't do algebra, cannot do algebra. They're what I call the clever engineering department. So I went back through all the projects I worked on, where I spent a lot of time out in the big plant. And it was kind of an interesting division of engineering. Your degreed engineer would do the more mathematical things, boilers, refrigeration, roof, wind load, snow load, power, and water. But the guys in the shop with no degrees were built, doing what I call clever engineering. Think mechanically clever packaging machine, for example. And those are the people that are not getting replaced. The hmm. people that invent mechanically complicated equipment that you use in food processing, 
also in other industries. What what was it about why these certain products or materials, machines are being made in Holland? Like what about their educational system that is different? Well, what different? they do in Holland and in Europe, and I've looked it up, when the kids are around 14, you can decide to go university route or technical vocational route. And they don't look at the vocational route as a lesser form of intelligence. Hmm. I think completely in pictures. Can't do higher math. I have no abstract thinking. And and uh, so in figuring out how mechanical things work, that is easy. I also went back through all the projects I've worked on, and I started writing down all the people I've worked with. I'm going to estimate that 20% of the people that designed machinery doing the drawings and people who are inventing machinery with about 20 patents each were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. They were the kids where the shop teacher turned them around. Mm-hmm. And that's what this is what motivated me to do this book. In the book, you talk about object visualizers and spatial visualizers. That's right. And the spatial visualizers think more in patterns. It's patterns instead of photorealistic pictures. See, everything I think about is a photorealistic picture. I was just out at a big corporation yesterday that works in travel, and I, we were trying to like help blind people and deaf people to get through the airport. Hmm. So I got to, th- you know, then this blind person there said, well, the worst thing I have at the airport is I can't find the gates. So then I started thinking up a way I could do gate finder app for his phone, maybe put little transponders on the gates. So as he walks through the terminal, he will say A60, A62. Right. And announce the gates as you walk by them. Aren't and there some? I, and I and there's off the shelf technology that I can probably do that with. That's real simple. I would think that there are some airports that naturally do something like that, right? Or is that is that not uh, common? Well, I want to do something that doesn't cost a lot of money. You see, I <laughs> tend to think very simple. You know, the, the the programmer wants to put more and more stuff on it. But okay, how about the deaf person? Well, I figured out I'm going to classify gates at the airport as visible gates and auditory gates. And and I see it, and I see the exact door at our Denver airport where four or five flights are coming out of one door, and you can't see any of the aircraft. So you're totally dependent on hearing the announcements at those gates. Where a visible gate, I can see the people line up, and there's one door, one aircraft. And right. so if I was deaf, I'm not going to miss those flights. Right. So, okay, see how, you see, I just see it. And I see it at a specific airport. And I do a so, lot of travel all the time. And so yeah. I kind of just think up, what's a simple way I could do it? And I could train the gate agents to just, um, they can talk back and forth using the text function on the phone and they don't have to send them. And you want to train uh, the gate yeah. agent that they got a deaf person and they have an auditory gate that they need to tap that person on the shoulder to get them up, up to the door. You see, that would be easy to do. Are, are you familiar with the uh, uh, framework, I guess, of universal design? Yes. Um, where, In other words, let's take subtitles going on on programs. Well, every bar is using that now. Right, right. And it was originally right. designed for you know people that we were hearing impaired. There's this definite movement in education right now uh, to bring the concept of your universal design into de- designing curriculum. So, you know, you have you have a number of uh, learners in a classroom and they may or may not have all of these different, you know, learning styles or uh, types of uh, ways of, of well, learning in different in brains. I'll tell you, in the state of California, I wouldn't be able to graduate from high school because I can't do the math requirements. Right, right, exactly. So, so I, just you know, I do want to get... And and the people I worked with, some of them had twenty patents each. They also were terrible at math, at higher. Yeah, math. they could do arithmetic. Well, I, I, well, that that is something I wanted to talk about because, um, you know, in the book you talk a lot about, um, that we're screening out kids. We're screening, we're screening out screening out what I call the clever engineering department. They mm-hmm. also super good at photography. I've talked to a lot of news crews, a lot of, you know, TV and movie photographers. A lot of them are dyslexic or ADHD, and they got exposed to cameras and 
and we're able to get into that field. And then also animals, because animals don't live in a word-based world. They live in a sensory-based world. It's sensory-based. It's not word-based. And I think right. some of the discussion about animal consciousness, and I just read an article yesterday, whether a computer could be conscious, and in the New York Times, and they, some people think you have to think in words to be conscious. Well, then I guess I'm not conscious then. Right. What yeah. I have found as a designer that I want to figure out, let's go back to the blind people and the deaf people at the airport. I've had a lot of success in getting a livestock industry to change. And one of the reasons why I was able to do it is I was able to fix a lot of stuff without buying tons and tons and tons of expensive equipment. Management, repairs, non-slip flooring, simple changes. It's one of the reasons why it was successful. Mm -hmm. And so I immediately start thinking, how can I do a simple things? Like just, um, I can go through the Denver airport. I can say, okay, that's an auditory gate. That one, there's two doors. They're just horrible. I've almost missed flights there. You have to really, really pay attention. Where all the other gates, I can see the plane roll up. But even if I can't see the plane roll up, I I can see the people line up at the right. door. So I, so I, I tend to tell them to tune out announcements. So I like to look at the door. And then when I see the people getting up and lining up, then I would know they'll line up. See, so I see what you're saying yeah, is about this. What you're saying is if you make small, mm, not not necessarily small, but practical, simple changes to an environment to make things more accessible, whether that's for people or for animals. Well, exactly. Um, and and things like wheelchair ramps, like on, on a new construction, they don't cost hardly anything to put in on new construction. Right, right. And then you use them for everything else, uh, bringing uh, you know, food deliveries in and things like that. I've seen them wheelchair ramp used for that right so the things that you've done or advocated for for the for animal welfare seems to have really changed the industry in in a positive way well um, and it's, it, it's it's very simple the thing i've learned and i've trained a lot of people how to do audits i've trained a lot of people in cattle handling you have to have really simple clear <laughs> guidance there's a lot of stuff that gets very abstract very vague mm -hmm. and Let's say I'm going to train an auditor to audit animal welfare at a meat plant. I got a day and a half workshop to do that in. And I developed a very simple scoring system uh, where they score electric pride use. They score stunning efficacy on uh, things that are easy to measure. And you have to figure out what are the important things to measure. It's sort of like traffic on the highway. If I can only measure five things to enforce safety, it's going to be drunk driving, speeding, running red lights and stop signs, Texting and seatbelts. Those are the critical control points for traffic. Those yeah. are the things you really need to enforce. That's a good point, though, the way you talked about enforcement, right? So you, you can have all of these checklists and you can do audits and you can say these things are wrong and that need to be fixed. But if there's no accountability to actually fix the problems, then they just stay the same. But you're measuring outcomes. So one of the things we measure is slipping and falling during handling. Measure electric pride blood. You measure cattle vocalizing when you're handling them. Because if they're vocalizing, you're doing something nasty to them. Pulling electric prods, slamming a door on them, something bad's happening. Mm -hmm. and, and, these, and you have to figure out what are the critical things to measure. In food safety, we have a concept, HACCP, hazard analysis, critical control points. What are the critical outcome measures to measure? And I got a day and a half workshop to train an auditor. One of my students is an auditor right now. And then they have two or three shadow audits with an experienced auditor. And then you turn them loose. Yeah. So I've had lunch with my student that's now an auditor. All right, now we got to do, let me show you some really good scoring tools for laying hands on feather condition. We're looking them up. You need to use these websites. But you've got to have have um, simple guidance that they can do there's a tendency to get things way too complicated so a big concern of yours that you bring up in the book is learners who are on the autism spectrum that spend way too much time playing video games or being lost in 
wh- whatever They're it is. They're not getting good jobs. There's, there's probably, you know, 100 students for every slot, actual slot in the video game industry. I'll tell you one way to get them off the video games. There's been some real successes with young adults introducing car mechanics, where they've actually gotten jobs in car mechanics. And they discover that engines are more interesting than video games. But mm. we've got kids growing up today that have never used a tool. They don't cook. They don't sew. I had a girl in my class who would never used a ruler to measure anything last year. They're not making stuff and, and doing stuff. Because the other thing is students have to be introduced to different things to find out what they love, also find out what they hate. Right. How right. can you find out whether you like working on cars if you never get introduced to any of that stuff? So people ask me, what would I do if I could do something for the schools? Put all the hands-on classes back in. Shop. It, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, so give me an welding, example of what you mean shop, by hands. Cooking, sewing, art, theater, music, all of these things. And some well, states are starting to do it already. Yeah, and yeah, and and so yeah, like I'm just thinking about the districts here in Georgia, uh, where I live, um, that they they still have all of those. But you know, the the interesting thing is though, um, those classes aren't always accessible to people, you know, with more significant disabilities or people with you know. Well, well the thing is, autism's got probably got with autism diagnosis. You're going from Einstein who would definitely land in an autism class today because he didn't talk until he was three. And the mm-hmm. kids that don't talk like go into autism classes. But what happened to him today, you go from Einstein to somebody that cannot dress themselves. And it all has the same name. So, you know, when you're talking about the, the kind of support uh, a learner might need, you know, and one might need more support than the other, like you said, um, you know, someone who is speaking and versus non-speaking or, you know, the life skills. But some uh, of the ones are, that cannot speak actually ascribe problems with sensory scrambling, problems with not being able to control their movements, mm-hmm, and they can type mm-hmm. independently without being touched. And there's some good books on that, too, like Tita Maka Hadavhe, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? Right, right. So, I mean, how can we make sure that those classes, those hands-on classes, like you said, are also available to, you know, people who have high support needs, like what you said, you know, who are are learning how to, you know, spell uh, to communicate or type to communicate. Well, I can tell you, I need to do something because I've been on some elevators with doors that weren't working right, skipping floors, scraping in the shaft. I'm back to full travel now. Mm-hmm. And they haven't been surfaced. And I noticed that stuff. Brand new escalator at one of the airports is already squeaking. So, in your view, the one of the one of the big ways to handle that is to bring all of these more technical type classes back into the schools. Well, that's right. You see, and the other thing is, there's a tendency here to say, "Well, once we go to the university, well, I know a guy that um, took a welding class in high school. He was not autistic." started a tiny little steel and concrete construction company, now has a big construction company in corporate jet. You know, very, very successful. There's a tendency to, I, I think that there, there are a lot of verbal thinkers that don't even know that visual thinking, like my kind of thinking, even exists. Because when I was doing a book signing for my book, Visual Thinking, in October, I did one of the talks in a school, and I talked to the principal, and he didn't even know that my kind of thinking existed. And, you know, and I was telling him about how I think. Is there any connection between being a visual thinker and autism or neurodiversity? Well, they, what tends to happen in autism is that most people with the different kinds of thinkers, the object visualizer who thinks in photorealistic pictures, horrible at abstract math, the mathematical person who thinks in patterns, most people are mixtures. But when you get on the autism spectrum, you tend to get an extreme. You might get an extreme object visualizer, an extreme mathematician. You know, autism can come in all three flavors of thinking. Or a verbal thinker who knows every fact about baseball or some other thing that they're really interested in. They can be really good at specialized retail sales if they get some social coaching on how to interact with customers. Mm Mm-hmm. 
But I worked with people that were definitely autistic and they had 20 patents each. Well, they're so, all so retired. So what do you... You see, you, t- you said that the principal at the school that you did the book signing yeah. uh, didn't know that visual thinking was even a thing. So what didn't do know, educators... didn't know that my kind of thinking was a thing. That's yeah, what this do ed- what, what do educators need to know then about visual thinkers and how to spot them in classes? Well, if you have a lot of hands-on classes, visual thinkers are often very good at art. Art and mechanics go together. Art and mechanics... And they're really good at building things and understanding mechanical things if they have access to them. And then your pattern thinkers, let's teach those kids computer programming. Let's teach them higher math. I just talked to family the other day. They're six-year-olds bored stiff with baby math. Move them ahead. Bored kids turn into behavior problems. If he can do mm-hmm. um, high school math in, when he's seven years old, let him do it. He may need He may need a help of reading do, do you think that's a, a problem just in how we've constructed our standards that we are requiring too much of one kind of math i think that's part of the problem because someone like me needs to just take business math which i can do you know so i know how to you know invoice clients cost out jobs i do payroll Mm-hmm. You know, stuff you need to do. To, to, fortunately, I had a very good mentor, a contractor that saw my drawing ability. And I can show you some of my drawings. See, the way I used to sell jobs is I simply would show off my drawings. Now, I know that uh, oh, won't show up on the podcast. No, but, but can you describe the can you describe the drawing? It's a drawing for a beef packing plant ramp system. Okay. And you might wonder why it's curved. You see, cattle like to go back to where they come from. Also, by making it curved, they don't see commotion that might be going up at the other end of it. Right. So that's another is, reason for doing that. Is this the – did you write about that in Thinking um, – Yeah, I wrote about that in Thinking in Pictures. Now, at the okay. time I did Thinking in Pictures, I didn't know that there was scientific research to show that there's a difference between an object visualizer and the visual spatial. You see, and in my visual thinking book, I looked up all that research, and and there's been a, quite a lot of it. You still um, are a professor at University yes, of Colorado? I'm a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. Colorado State. Class on livestock handling and behavior. And you see, an animal lives in a sensory-based world, not a word-based world. I tell students, you want to understand your dog, your puppy, for example, you've got, you've got to get away from verbal language. What's your puppy smelling? What's he seeing? He's got a nose that's 100 times more sensitive than our nose. And I just read some new research that Cornell University did with high-definition brain scanning. And I found out that the dog has a big Internet circuit that goes from the olfactory areas of the brain to the visual cortex. Think smell pictures. Right. Smell pictures. Smell pictures. I took one look at those brain scans from Cornell University, and I go, wow. That's trippy. Smell. <laughs> Try to imagine that. Okay, yeah, because you uh, you've mentioned how you you think of a or if someone says a word that you have a lot of different pictures. Of, or well, that's right. You see, they they uh, in the HBO movie about me. There's a scene where it says shoe, the word mm-hmm. shoe, and a whole bunch of shoes come up. You see nothing. And that's that how you described. describe it. Well, they used. 50s and 60s pictures of shoes and they just came up like a series of PowerPoint slides like that. Mm-hmm. Or back in my generation, 35 millimeter slides. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. Now, now PowerPoint slides. Exactly. Um, so that, that would be the same thing if you're saying um, a dog's sense of smell will trigger vi- pictures as well. Is, well, is, is what I, kind of what I, you're I, thinking? I don't know. I just know that this is new research that shows the dog has this gigantic circuit in the brain. This was just discovered within the last year. Mm-hmm. And the olfactory areas of the brain are wired up to the visual cortex. So maybe he can, maybe he makes a smell picture in space, different smell. I don't know. All I know now is that that circuit is there. So in the, in the book, you, you seem to... Um, make the connection between how we we undervalue 
animals because they're not verbal, right? They well, don't I speak. Think we're, we're, I think some of the discussion, we still have a discussion going on, you know, where some people say maybe a puppy's not truly con- conscious. I don't think you believe your puppy is not conscious. Right, yeah. Well, and I think a lot of this gets down to people that are very verbal-based might have a hard time imagining how you could think without words. Mm-hmm. Well, I can think without words. And I was just at a big thing, a big corporate meeting yesterday, and we were discussing uh, airport access for blind and deaf. So I just started getting all these pictures of of um, our different airports I've been in and imagining a blind person with an app on his phone. And as he walked, because the blind person told me finding gates drove him just crazy, where he's walking through the terminal and the gate numbers are getting announced to him with an app on the phone. You see, I just see that. Now, how does it read the gate numbers without having to have a complicated artificial intelligence program? Well, I can take little transponders, maybe like what they use for toll roads, and stick them on the gate signs. That's right, so that it'll... an off-the-shelf technology. So it right. isn't going to cost a fortune. So I'm always trying to do something simple and practical so the airport can't give you any reason for not doing it. <laughs> I, I think the, I think, you know, educational advocates who want to change things in schools, I think that that is a, that's a lesson that we can learn is finding things that are practical that don't cost money. Well, that's what I did. You see, when I did the work for the meatpacking plants and I trained the McDonald's people how to inspect the plants and use my scoring system, it was real simple. The plant had five numbers they had to make. And 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 to, to attain it, out of 75 plants, biggest ones in the country, beef and pork both, only three had to buy expensive stuff. All the others we did with things, a lot of non flooring had to go in. That's not a capital expense. Uh, lighting, cows are afraid of the dark, training, and three plant managers had to be removed. But one yeah, of the it does, why it worked it does come down to people. Not to shove equipment down their throat. Right. But I, um, I, going back to, you know, plant managers being removed, you know, sometimes, I mean, it, it, a lot of it has to do with management, don't you think? Oh, like, yes. Because I would say half the fix is this management. That's one yeah. of the most important things you can do. And we constantly have to stay after that. Something yeah. in the book that I wanted to discuss was... Uh, are you talking about the disability trap or having a disability mindset? What does that mean? Well, I see too many parents. They have a kid that's autistic, maybe doing well in high school, getting good grades, not learning work skills, also not learning life skills like shopping. I'm having a lot of parents that can't let go and get their child out doing things, like going in a store, buying something themselves, learning about money, Um doing laundry, just learning life skills. And this is, you see, and that's so the parents are almost holding them back. They're not learning how to do enough stuff. They're not getting out and doing enough stuff. Why do you think families are falling into that? I think they get locked into the label. I have another book called Navigating Autism that I do with Deborah Moore. And the whole mm-hmm. premise of that book is parents get so locked into the label, they don't see what the child can do. Okay, I can't do algebra. That's just not going to happen. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff I can do. In fact, Stephen Hawking, the famous scientist, right before he died, told the New York Times, concentrate on those things your disability does prevent you from doing well. And he could do math in his head super well. That's what he did. You see, they get a mindset. And I've seen this over and over again. You got a 16-year-old doing really well in school, good grades, Never has gone in a store and bought something by themselves. That's getting yeah, locked that seem, into the label. I was shopping. That when seems I was like a problem. Seven and eight years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that seems like a problem. If if uh, if you haven't done that mm-hmm. yet, right? It does, the, despite you know whatever sort of disability label you have, you know, because he, I mean you want uh, whether you have whether you have a diagnosis or not, you still want to. I worked interact with, with people that were right? They had 20 patents each, and, and the industry is using their stuff. And I, since they're not 
disclosed. I, I have to be vague about the things they made. Yeah, yeah, sure. Right? sure. The, if you're in the livestock industry, you've seen the stuff and used it. Right. Um, so it, also in the book, you seem to be um, critical of, I guess, autistic people who want to build their bit like a business around speaking about autism or advocacy. Well, I'm not against um, advocacy, but I tell them you're a better advocate if you can talk about how, how you, you got a job and you held that job. One thing I learned was um, to sell my work. I sold Cargill by showing a drawing very similar to this one that your listeners will not be able to see. I, I, I sent them a drawing and I sent them pictures of jobs. I learned to sell my work. They took one look at those things and I sold Cargill and I designed the front end of a, every Cargill beef plant in North America. That's steel and concrete work and then mechanical stuff too. Right. So it, you weren't getting jobs necessarily based because you were autistic. Oh, you were no, getting jobs no. and stuff. I'll tell you, in the 70s, biggest barrier for me in the 70s was being a woman. Autism mm. was a non-issue. Being a woman, yeah, huge issue. But I recognized doors to opportunity. There's a scene in that movie where I get the editor's card. And I realized if I wrote for our state farm magazine, that would help my career. And I got a reputation covering industry meetings really accurately. Yeah. So you, you use the strength that you had That's already. Right. And fortunately, I learned how to write. A lot of students today have terrible writing skills. Because they never yeah, did a so, full report, they never had teachers mark up the work and make them correct the grammar. It, as much as as much as you say that you're a visual thinker, you're an excellent communicator via words. Is, is that is, are, are words also visual for you? Well, when I say words, okay. Right now, I just saw the alphabet in my third grade classroom posted over the blackboard, the green board. I got that picture flashed into my mind. See, words kind of narrate the pictures. You must be a, you a real verbal thinker. I guess. You know, I was thinking about this um, er, earlier. So when I go to sleep, <coughs> when I, you know, when I'm trying to fall asleep, I will often like think about the things that I need to do for the next day as a way now, to Now, when you kind think of, about, when I think about the things I'm going to do for the next day, uh, like tomorrow I've got a seminar I'm seeing the building right now, the, the classrooms in the building where we're going to be doing that meeting. And I'm seeing mm -hmm. those classrooms right now. Yeah, I, I'm seeing I guess the classroom I am, where I teach my course in right now. Yeah, I guess I am more of a verbal thinker. And I actually, so audio to me is a, is um, something that I really enjoy. So, you know, obviously because of the podcast, I enjoy producing audio and doing interviews and stuff like that. But I also consume a lot of content uh, with audio, like someone speaking. And I tend to really enjoy that and, and retain the information that way. I'd rather read um, it. You would rather read it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, see, I um, I mean, I, I enjoy reading, but if I have a choice... Um, I'll pick the audio. Well, the problem is I don't retain audio. Like if I have mm. to listen to audio and retain it, I have to take notes. Yeah, I think if I read it, I have to take notes. No, I'm the opposite. <laughs> I'd rather read it. And and yeah. I, and if I have to listen to, in audio, I uh, to remember some of the super important things, I need to write it down usually. Yeah, that so um so I don't know necessarily I mean I guess I'm I would be You must be you know, totally you know, auditory much more verbal. Now I t I do a lot of talks to big corporations. I said the first step is realizing that different types of thinking exist and the things they can do for their company. Okay, so let's say it's a tech company that has a travel website for example, I can work on the interface. The programmers work on how it works. Well, when I signed into their corporate office, I managed to erase my signature like five times. Because I kept pressing the wrong thing, uh, well, I think they're going to be changing their interface on that. See, it wasn't clear when we talked about interface. Okay, like on one of the airlines, you go to check in, 
and they want to get you on other flights because they're packed solid. So you, they want you to click got it. And I go, wait a minute. If I click got it, am I going to erase my reservation? Well, now I know that with that airline, that will not erase my reservation. I, but when I first did that, I go, if I type, got, if I click got it, that's going to take my reservation away. I don't think right. that's the best interface. Um, are you good directionally? Like, are like, do you have a like a map in your head with where to go? What are I like really to do, with- I absolutely despise just using the uh, GPS because it tells me too late when to turn. Mm. I prefer to get on Google Maps. I want to map out my whole route so I can kind of see it in my head, and then I make little checklist of each turn. 50 miles, you know, I-70 east, and exit number, the next bullet point or, or thing on the checklist, exit, you know, 360. I go turn right, south, something like that. But then I kind of see the overall map. See, I'm not a sequential thinker. I want to look at the map. I like to know where I'm going when it's someplace new before I go. So uh, do you consider yourself a spokesperson for the autism community? Well, I'm just one person that tells about the experiences. And basically mm-hmm. right now, I'm in my 70s now. I want to see the kids that are different get out and get great careers. Because some of the most fun stuff, people that I know are autistic that I've worked with on uh, designing equipment, uh, skilled trade stuff, uh, designing, drafting. Some of the most fun stuff we ever had was sitting around discussing how to build things. That was really fun. And and I want to see the kids that are different get out and do those fun jobs. Or if they're a mathematical type, get a good tech job where they're a really good programmer. I want to see them get those good jobs. And I've had parents say to me, once they got the kid out working in a job they really liked, oh, he just blossomed. She blossomed. She bloomed. I hear that comment over and over and over again. I want to help people get good careers. Also, we need the skills, and we need them really badly, especially object visualizers. Yeah. And that's kind of your the, the, the premise of the book, right? You want people to know uh, <laughs> that these types of thinking exist. I want people to know these types of thinking exist. And when a kid gets a label, whether it's dyslexic, ADHD, or autism, you tend to have more extremes, like an extreme object visualizer or an extreme mathematician. they are opposites. Or an extreme word thinker. Where so-called regular people, much more mixtures. And how can schools specifically support all well, of these kinds thing of is, thinkers? Well, a lot of it varies with state. Having all the hands-on classes in the schools... And you can see what the kid gravitates towards. Because what I've found on careers, you've got to have exposure. Like a single welding class or maybe a music class. Now, I was exposed to musical instruments. I was horrible at playing them. But I was exposed to it. I had a chance to use the same computer that Bill Gates used. The exact same computer. He could do it. I couldn't. But I was exposed to it. So I'm a big fan of exposing students to lots of different stuff. Because what I'm finding on careers for a lot of people, exposure when you're young, then mentoring. But you do the exposure first. Hmm. What does that mentoring look like? Because it well, seems to me let, there's let, far let, too let, few let, like school counselors and stuff well, like that. Well, I had a great science teacher. <laughs> and I was not interested in studying. And he gave me interesting projects to do. And I got motivated to study because bad grades in history and English was just goofing off. Um, I now study because I wanted to become a scientist. I now had a reason to study. He was an important mentor, my science teacher. And then there was Jim the contractor starting a little tiny steel and concrete business. Former Marine Corps captain. He seeked me out. He showed me how to set up my business. I didn't know how to do that. Okay, that's an example of mentoring. I get asked, how did I get in the cattle industry? 
I came from back east. I got exposed to it as a teenager on my aunt's ranch. It's exposure first, then mentoring. And a lot of people on the autism spectrum that have been successful in the workplace have their own businesses. That's common. And the people I work right. with that definitely were autistic, um, they owned their own businesses. And then they usually have to have someone else to help them more with the <clears throat> business part of it. Payroll, um, ordering materials, bidding jobs. The other problem with educators is they don't know anything about industrial stuff. They haven't been in factories, most of them. Well, that's not their education, right? No. And and um, when where we're really losing it is with the object visualizers like me. Yeah, elevators and escalators. People working on that older and older and older. And we need those skills. Any other thoughts that you want to make sure educators understand about visual thinkers? Well, first of all, you got to know they exist. And I think we're going to have to start looking at some of these math requirements. You see, the kids that go the tech route in Europe, I mean, you do some business math, which is arithmetic. I have no problem with that. Or I use an algebraic formula, pi times a radius squared size hydraulic cylinders, because that's a formula for a very specific thing, sizing hydraulic cylinders. Okay, that I would know how to do. But you see the math in the abstract. No, I, I can't remember it. There's nothing to visualize. See, there's, I, I've, talk, when I was up, I've been talking about this. I have so many people come up to me say, well, I'm one of those kids that flunked algebra three times and I can't become a veterinary technician. You don't need abstract algebra to be a veterinarian or a veterinary technician. Well, I, I think there is again, a lesson for us to learn as educators that um, we have all these different kinds of thinkers. We really should be designing and supporting All right, let's talk about how the students. complementary skills. Let's go back to the food processing plant. The degree okay. engineer does some more mathematical parts. Wind load, snow load, power requirements, water requirements, boilers and refrigeration. The people in the shop that maybe just start out with the welding class, they're designing all the clever, mechanically clever equipment. And more and more of that's coming from Italy and Holland and places in Europe. And you go back and you look up the educational system for those different countries. Kids can either go um, a university route or tech route. And in Italy, they have a third thing. They have an art route. You know, because they have Isn't all that the an argument? industry. Isn't that an argument for project-based learning? Like we yes, should be and, and, moving. And the thing is, I think we need to be looking at, what's the ultimate goal of education? Where's a student 10 years after high school? I was doing the projects that were shown in the movie 10 years after high school. And I can tell you, one of the things that motivated me to do those projects is I wanted to prove to people I was not stupid. That motivated mm -hmm. Well, uh, pr uh, working on projects and working on projects together with different kinds of learners seems like more of a real world application well, anyways. It is. And even because in, in the book, visual thinking book, I tend to be kind of disorganized because my thinking is associational. So I wrote all the rough drafts for the chapters and Betsy, my verbal co-author, rearranged them <laughs> and, and, and made them more linear for the verbal thinkers. So we deliberately had uh, complementary skills there. I wrote visual thinking because I'm very concerned about the skill loss. I'm seeing too many smart kids that would be very good at things like mechanical things or uh, art or photography or working with animals. Uh, just playing video games in the basement rather than in a job that they really would love. And then I see mathematical thinkers that might be, you know, young kids and they're getting behavior problem in school. Because they're making them do baby math, they need to be moved ahead into more advanced math. Dr. Temple Grannon, thank you so much for being on the Think Inclusive podcast. We appreciate your time. It was great to be here. Think Inclusive is written, edited, and sound designed by Tim Villegas and is a production of MCIE. Original music by Miles Kredich. 
If you enjoyed today's episode, here are some ways that you can help our podcast grow. Share it with your friends, family, and colleagues. And if you haven't already, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Special thanks to our patrons, Melissa H., Sonia A., Pamela P., Mark C., Kathy B., Kathleen T., Jarrett T., Gabby M., Aaron P., and Paula W. for their support of Think Inclusive. For more information about inclusive education or to learn how MCIE can partner with you and your school or district, visit mcie.org. One last thing, Temple wrote an op-ed in the New York Times called Society is Failing Visual Thinkers and That Hurts Us All. I'm going to put a link in the show notes. It should be unlocked. Hopefully it'll stay that way. Go check it out and let me know what you think. Thanks for your time and attention. And remember, inclusion always works. Inclusion always works.